Typically, they're superpowers. But did you know that animals have some incredible superpowers? Sure, just like a lot of our favorite superheroes that are out there. And in particular, a group of birds known as the raptors. They're going to have incredible abilities, including telescopic vision, turbo speed, hulkish strength, and acid spit vomit. That's right. This is only one group of animals. That's a group of raptors, also known as birds of prey. And they're a specialized group that is going to be characterized by excellent eyesight, a sharp hooked upper beak to tear meat with, and a powerful set of feet and sharp talons that they use to capture and kill their prey. But they're not going to be eating any fruits or seeds, only other animals. And this is a very large category. It's going to include hawks, eagles, falcons, owls, kites, caracaras, harriers, vultures, osprey, and there's a couple others as well. But they do very well for themselves, no matter where you find them across the globe. And today, you guys are going to get to meet some of our local raptors and our superheroes found in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So one of the best examples of a raptor and a bird with an amazing superpower is this fellow right here. This is Isham, our red-tailed hawk. And there's a very good chance you guys have seen a red-tailed hawk before as you have been uh, driving across the country. And uh, they are going to be spending their day perched in the highest available spot in places like Wyoming and Montana. Usually that means a fence post or power pole. But they're going to be soaring leisurely up above the prairie using excellent eyesight to scan the landscape for their favorite things to eat. Now this is what we call a generalist. So they're going to go after a wide variety of critters that are out there. And they're going to go after delicious mice and voles, ground squirrels, rat, uh, excuse me, rats, rabbits, snakes. If you're not a big fan of snakes, here's your new best friend. He's very good at going after snakes. They'll go after some small songbirds from time to time as well. But none of this sounds particularly super or amazing, does it? We have to think about it. He has to have some incredible vision because he's looking for a brown or gray critter running around on a brown or gray background. They don't want to be spotted. And so he has to have that incredible vision. Just how good a vision does he have? Well, if Isham were sitting on top of the fence behind the stage here, he could actually see a fly crawling around on the door that you all walked through as you were moving out here to our program. That's how good of eyesight they have. Most birds of prey, it's estimated, can see things about a mile away, depending on how they focus the lens in their eye. They're going to see colors a lot brighter and more vivid than what you or I will be able to see, and they're going to process images faster than the human eye can handle. So it's very easy to follow swift moving prey there. Now, uh, they don't get this incredible vision from being dunked in a vat of radioactive goo or anything. It's actually due to the size and shape of their eyes. Hawk eyes take up over 50% of their skull. And believe it or not, if we proportionally stretched Isham out where he was as tall as I am, his eyeballs are going to be the size of tennis balls. Yeah, how would you like to have eyeballs that big in your skull? That's pretty amazing. That would also be one of the most terrifying hawks out there. Uh, but they're gonna have that incredible vision. And what's really neat is, they don't have a completely round eye like we do as humans. And so we have a, 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 an eyeball, it's completely round. There's room for muscle attachments behind that eye. And we can actually roll our eyes in our sockets without rotating our whole head and seeing what's going on around us. Hawk eyes and raptor eyes, I should say, are longer than they are wide, like this. This is a comparison here. This is the raptor eye. And it looks kind of uh, like an ice cream cone, sort of getting bigger as it goes back into that skull. And this unique size and shape of the eyeball is what allows these guys to have so much better vision than we have as humans. Uh, but uh, it just really helps them to see things magnified or even as large as two to three times larger than what we can see. So it's almost like you're looking through binoculars for your dinner there. So they're very good at locating all of those delicious critters that we talked about. But that is not all. So he has incredible vision, but he also has super pest control abilities there. And they really do help us out. All raptors are excellent for natural pest control. To give you an idea, Isham living here with us at the center of the west can eat at least four mice every single day. And he's not actively burning any calories trying to chase down and capture and kill his prey. It's brought to him on a silver platter, so he doesn't have to work too hard for it. But a red-tailed hawk in the wild can easily eat at least four mice a day. And on average, they live around 15 to 18 years or so with a little bit of skill and luck. And so, if we do a little bit of math on vacation, everyone's ready for math on vacation, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, it's all right, I've done the figures for you, but uh, if we have Isham eating four mice every single day for an average of 15 years, that means just one hawk has the potential to eat over 22,000 mice in his or her lifetime. The best part about that for us, there are no pesticides or chemicals involved, and he's not gonna charge you for it either. So it really helps us out. Uh, now, 
You have lots and lots of red-tailed hawks out here. They are going to be easily identified by this beautiful brick red tail that gives them their name. But it actually is kind of tricky to correctly identify these birds. Because they're so widespread, they are found all across north and parts of Central America, there's a lot of color variation. So you're going to see albino red-tailed hawks. They're completely all white. Some are leucistic, where they're all white, but they have that beautiful brick red tail. And they go all the way to the other end of the color spectrum. And especially in the Pacific Northwest, you will see dark chocolate colored red-tailed hawks. They're beautiful birds. So it can be very difficult to correctly identify these guys. And a lot of people will say, oh, it's just a big brown bird. But I'm going to tell you a few tips to correctly identify these guys, especially if you can't see that red tail. So the first thing that we'll have you look for when you're out and about is look for a belt or belly band going across the bird's waist. Now, unfortunately, Isham actually came to us from New Mexico, and so his belly band is about 14 feathers scattered all across his breast there. So there are always exceptions in nature. But the majority of red-tailed hawks that we have up in the Cody area will have a very pale, creamy-colored underside, almost white, and they will have a very distinct belly band going across their waist. So if you see that belt, going across there, you know that's a red-tailed hawk. That's a unique marking to that species. As they're soaring high over the prairie, they'll have these beautiful broad rounded wings, perfect for just leisurely moving around on that, the breeze there. And uh, the red-tailed hawk has a unique uh, set of markings on the underside of their wing. They will have a nice white or cream underside, just like I talked about, but the leading part of his wing, if you imagine this is the leading edge and we have a bunch of feathers hanging down here, the leading part is going to have a dash usually a dark brown or black in appearance. There's a space, and then it looks like a comma or a parenthesis. So if you see a hawk that has a dash and then a parenthesis, you know that's a red-tailed hawk. None of the other hawks are gonna have that particular style of marking there. Um, sometimes they have their wings in and you don't necessarily see the front of them. They might have their back to you when you're <coughs> just driving by on the roadside. This is a really good giveaway and we're really excited that we learned about this because it made my life so much easier trying to identify these guys on the sides of the road. So as you look at this from here, he's got his back to you. You'll notice when he's got his wings tucked in, there's almost a light kind of a, a russet or a tan colored V that you'll see on his wings there. None of the other hawks are going to have that light colored V that is visible there. So if you see that, you instantly know that's a red-tailed hawk. Even if the lighting's not right and you can't see that red tail, but if you see that V, you know that's a red-tailed hawk. Now one last really cool thing, you don't even have to see these birds to correctly identify them. Uh, and many of you, I'm sure, have watched the Old West films and you'll have this iconic scene, the camera's panning across the beautiful valley, and then you see this huge bird of prey circling high overhead, and you hear this two to three second, yeah, nothing like that really. <laughs> Sorry, Isham, that's as good as it gets, but you'll hear a two to three second piercing cry, and that is actually the call of a red-tailed hawk. That does not usually match up with the bird that they have on camera. Um, a lot of the eagles, they're huge, they're impressive, but they don't sound nearly as majestic as a red-tailed hawk's call. And so Hollywood, in its great wisdom, has used the sound clips from a red-tailed hawk and paired it up with pretty much any bird that they film up in the sky. And what's really funny is especially, uh, I've seen images where there's vultures circling overhead and uh, you'll hear that cry and vultures don't have a voice box. They can't do anything besides hiss and grunt. So uh, you know it definitely doesn't match up with the bird that you're seeing there. So when you combine that incredible eyesight and, uh, that, of course, that wonderful pest control and dashingly handsome good looks there, uh, it really does make him a wonderful example of a superhero of nature. Let's give Isham a big round of applause. <laughs> All right, so he's got some pretty amazing superpowers, but you haven't seen anything yet because we've talked about some superheroes, but are there any supervillains that are out there? There is one group of birds that's seen as far more villainous than all the rest. That's right, the vultures. Unfortunately, vultures across the globe have been seen as evil and disgusting and are persecuted <coughs> mainly because of their diet. And what do vultures love to eat? Yeah. Carrion, dead stuff, roadkill, right. But that doesn't necessarily make you a villain, right? These guys are really amazing at what they do. This is nature's garbage collector, and they have some wonderful adaptations to help them out to do their job. So the first thing you might notice is Suli's hanging out in the sunshine here. She's spreading her wings out. She has about a five-foot wingspan, and she is warming up for the day. And this is a natural behavior. Many vultures and a lot of other birds will do this as well. But especially in the early morning, when it's still cool, if there's any moisture built up on those feathers, that makes flight very difficult. And so she would spread her wings out in what is called the heraldic pose, and that sunlight will bake off any bacteria that might coat those feathers and evaporate any moisture that's built up overnight. So she's just getting ready to soar for the day. 
And Sorin is really important for these guys because they're strictly scavengers and you have no idea where your next meal is going to occur for that day. So you have to be able to conserve a lot of energy and cover vast distances without burning a lot of calories there. Uh, and that's where the turkey vultures are really awesome. So once it's warm enough for the day, they will leave that perch, lock those large wings in place, and they were going to soar down into a nice thermal. It's a pocket of warm air. It slowly rises up higher and higher. That's what hot air does. And so they're going to basically enter this column of warm air. The updraft will push them up higher and they're going to get up to the top of that column of air. And that is where you get that iconic vultures circling overhead waiting for something to die. Everyone's familiar with that, right? It's not necessarily the fact that they're waiting for something to die directly beneath them but they're transporting themselves looking for that food there. So they're gonna find the top of that column there, it's done mostly by feel there, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna glide down. You're gonna leave that column, you're gonna lose a bit of altitude, you're gonna find the next column of warm air, and you're gonna get pushed up to the top of that one. And then you're gonna glide down, and you're gonna go over to the next column, and get pushed up to the top of the next one. And using this technique, turkey vultures can actually soar up to six hours without flapping their wings. Nothing villainous about that, right? The other really cool thing is turkey vultures have an amazing sense of smell. It's not quite like yours or mine, so if I had some strong cologne on, Suli's probably not going to care less, but she is very sensitive to the chemical known as mercaptan, and that's that rotting flesh smell, and they can smell that up to five miles away without even seeing it. They do have that amazing vision, just like the red-tailed hawk, but they're going to follow their nose to dinner, and that's really, really cool. So once you've located a nice carcass out in the field somewhere or along the roadside, you're going to land, and you can begin the feast. Now, the next thing you might notice is that Suli does not have any feathers on her head there. And a lot of people, their initial reaction when they see a turkey vulture up close is, that's not exactly the best looking bird. You just have to get to know them a little better. Suli actually has little tiny eyelashes. They're feathers, but they're basically like eyelashes, and she will flutter them at you if you get a close enough look. Uh, you just got to get to know them. So what's really helpful by having no feathers on your head who said bald isn't beautiful, right guys? They're gonna be able to stick that head into a carcass, get all the delicious nice meat at the back, and every time you pull your head out, if you had feathers on your head like that red-tailed hawk, you're gonna have all sorts of blood and gunk stuck up in there, and it's gonna be ruffled the wrong way, and it's very difficult to stay clean and therefore healthy. But by having this nice little peach fuzz on her head, basically, she just slicks her head out of the carcass, sits in the sunshine like she was earlier, and that heat will bake it right off, and it's very easy to stay clean and healthy. And in case anything gets in her nose there, she actually has two nostrils in her head. It looks like you can see through clean to the other side. She has two no nostrils in her head, just like you were me. But what you were seeing is a bone running from the tip of her nose to the tip of her lip. That's basically the equivalent. So she can stick her head into the carcass, get some good uh, food to eat, pull her head out, and she doesn't have to worry about having dinner shoved up your nose. You can breathe while you eat. So it takes a lot of time and energy that you don't have to worry about there. So, uh, now, the greatest ability, and one which makes them so undesirable, is the fact that these vultures can actually ingest meat that's been sitting out on the side of the road for several days. And uh, while this is not desirable to, to many of us as a superpower, this is where they have their greatest ability. And they have an incredibly, di uh, incredibly acidic digestive tract. To give you an idea, the pH of Suli's stomach acid is almost zero. It's more acidic than the battery acid in your car. And that allows her to not only eat meat that's been sitting out in the sun for a couple days, but there are some things that have died of some very deadly diseases. Not everything is roadkill. And so they can actually ingest meat that is contaminated with a variety of things like salmonella, cholera, botulism, rabies, even anthrax. That stomach acid is powerful enough, it will neutralize and kill off any of that disease or bacteria, and it's not passed on in the vulture's waste. So these guys are instrumental in making the world a lot healthier and happier for folks like us to enjoy, because they're gonna sterilize those carcasses right down to the bone. And in places where the, the uh, vulture populations across the globe are not doing as well for a variety of reasons, we're finding there's a corresponding increase in the disease rates in a lot of human pop populations as well. So if we have a healthy vulture population, and have some healthy humans here as well. Uh, now, if that wasn't cool enough, Suli has one more superpower, and that's her acidic projectile vomit defense. That's right, you thought I had forgotten, didn't you? And uh, technically, Suli is considered a raptor, but she does not have the powerful feet and sharp talons to capture and kill her prey. Like we talked about, she is strictly a scavenger, and so she doesn't have to squeeze down. Her prey is already dead, waiting for her there. Uh, so she has toes that are more like chicken or turkey toes, and they're better adapted for walking on the ground and bracing against your carcass while you're tearing off those bite-sized chunks to swallow there for dinner. And so what is she gonna do if she feels threatened? 
she's going to throw up. And this serves several purposes. Uh, it uh, is a wonderful distraction. You can imagine if you've been gorging on a deer carcass on the side of the road all day, you're going to be pretty full. And it's a lot harder to get up into the air versus when your stomach is empty. So you are going to lighten the load, so to speak, empty your stomach contents. You also have a very convenient distraction. If there's a hungry coyote or fox that is nearby and that's what you're worried about, you have a few seconds at least to get up into the air and escape another day there. However, some scientists have found that turkey vultures can project vomit up to six feet away. So front row, you're in the splash zone. <laughs> Hopefully you don't ever have to deal with that. <laughs> I can tell you from experience, it's not fun. Uh, but uh, these guys are really, when you take all of this into account, that excellent um, you know, ability to follow their, their nose to dinner, soaring for vast distances, incredibly acidic digestive tract, beautiful looks, of course, and of course that lovely acidic projectile vomit defense. I think it's safe to say we can reclassify the supervillain as a superhero for being one of the best garbage collectors out there. Let's give Suli a big round of applause. All right. Now, just like the Man of Steel, many of our raptors have their very own kryptonite, and unfortunately, that can be through many of man's creations. This can be through a combination of electrocution, poisoning, shootings, and collisions with man-made objects, including wind turbines and vehicles. And that's actually why several of our birds in our program are with us here. Isham was actually on the side of the road down near Tierra's New Mexico, and these guys are really smart. They have learned that they can hang out on the fence posts and the power poles and the sides of the road, and they're waiting for us humans to drive by in our vehicles. As we drive by in the vehicles, that movement startles all those delicious critters that we talked about that he loves to eat away from the road. And it's a perfect opportunity for him to fly down and get a good bite to eat. Sometimes, though, the prey gets scared across the road instead of away from it, and if you're fully focused in on that mouse or that rabbit, you don't necessarily see that oncoming truck and you can get hit. So Isham was hit by a vehicle. He suffered some permanent damage to his right side of his face there, and they luckily stopped, pulled over. They saw he was still, still alive, rushed him into the nearest wildlife rehabilitation center, and they had to surgically remove that eye to make him a little more comfortable. But as a result, he does not have the depth perception required to survive on his own and safely capture and kill his prey. So that's why Isham is living here with us. Don't feel too bad, though. He is an old hand to doing programs. He's actually 21 years old this year. Uh, so he's doing a great job with us. And he's a lot of our uh, handlers. He's one of their favorite groups to work with there. Uh, but uh, the nice thing is, through good care, nutrition, and access to medical facilities, we can actually double these guys' lifespans. And hopefully they'll be with us for many years to come. Uh, Suli is a little bit different. She was actually found when she was a young turkey vulture and uh, she was brought into a, a wildlife nature center there and they were trying to get an adult turkey vulture to act as a foster parent because she was orphaned at three weeks of age. Uh, and so they didn't have one though. So they raised her at that nature center. The staff took excellent care of her, but during that crucial stage of development, she never learned how to act as a turkey vulture. So she's what we call a human imprint. She thinks she's a person. She has no idea how to survive on her own. Uh, handle the air currents high up in the skies. Uh, we showed her her first dead deer carcass a couple years back and she just about had a heart attack. So uh, when, you're, when you're terrified of an easy food source there, that's not a good sign. Um, and also a couple years back when she, well, a couple years, <laughs> she is actually about 11 years old this year as well. Uh, but uh, she was uh, hit sexual maturity at two years of age and she came here to live with us and the hormones began raging through her body and they were, they were saying, you gotta find a boyfriend and she chose me. So that was always exciting. Springtime is always a, a thrill around here. Um, she is always trying to lure me into her enclosure using bits of leftovers from the previous evening's meal, rabbit ears, rat tails, fish bones, and she's trying to lure me in. I managed to resist her temptuous ways, and after about two to three weeks, the hormones die down again and we can be best buds. So uh, it's uh, always interesting around here. Uh, but uh, if you would like to help take care of and uh, be a superhero to our birds in the program or for the ones back home, there are a few things you can do in order to help. It can be as easy as picking up a piece of garbage, even if it's not yours. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. If you are a fisherman or if you're out by a lake and you see some loose fishing twine, be sure to gather that up and put that in the appropriate receptacle as well. Um, it causes a lot of issues for a lot of small birds in particular, including smaller raptors, where they can easily get tangled up in that fishing line and can lead to an untimely end there. Um, if you have any bird feeders or bird baths, make sure you scrub them out from time to time, as they can become vectors for disease for some of the small songbirds utilizing that. If you have any cats, make sure you keep them inside. They're excellent at mousing, but also they're notorious for going after billions of songbirds across the globe every single year. Add some extra incentive. Some of the larger raptors, like those great horned owls, love to eat the cats, so the cats really want to be let back inside as well. 
Um, as you are uh, headed out, you'll notice we have a couple donation boxes. This is our shameless plug here. If you want to help take care of our superheroes, drop a couple of bills in those boxes. It all goes directly towards covering the food and medical costs for our birds here. Suli is not too picky with what she gets, but she gets the same restaurant quality rat as everyone else, so that increased the cost of, uh, costs a little bit. Isham loves lots and lots of mice and rats as well, although he likes quail from time to time. Uh, but everything goes in there, and it goes towards a good cause helping our birds out. Um, as you continue your travels, heading on into Yellowstone, make sure you follow those speed limits. There's lots of wildlife along these roadways out here. Not only there are birds of prey, but we have large ungulates, deer, elk, antelope, and of course those big woolly bison. And they can have a significant impact on your bumpers, your wallets, and of course your lives as well. So we want everyone to continue their safe travels and enjoy nature from a safe distance as well. If you have any questions, we welcome you to come on up to the edge of the stanchions here, get some photographs of the birds. If you are finished with us here and ready to get into them, air, some air conditioning and get some lunch and take a break, enjoy the rest of your afternoon here in Cody. Thank you very much, folks. Take care.